Hi everybody and welcome to lesson 2.8 nuclear power. The content in this video is aligned to the third edition of environmental science for AP and covers information from College Board Unit 6.6. We're continuing our deeper dive into the variety of energy generation resources and processes. Here we will be discussing nuclear power. This leads us to the content objective of understanding that humans use energy from a variety of sources resulting in positive and negative consequences. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to identify and describe the parts of a nuclear power plant, describe the use of nuclear power plants in electricity generation, and describe the effects of using nuclear energy on the environment. Which leads us to being able to answer the guiding question. Why is nuclear energy a beneficial transition to renewables? Nuclear power plants are specially designed to allow for controlled nuclear reactions. Here we see a diagram that identifies the major components needed to utilize the energy produced from a nuclear reaction to generate electricity. We will cover all of these components, but we will not do them in the alphabetical order shown on the diagram. However, let's start with the structure marked A. This is the containment structure which is usually built out of lead-lined reinforced concrete. Its purpose is to hold the reactor, marked C, which is where the nuclear reaction actually takes place. The reactor is made up of three major pieces. The first are the fuel rods, marked K, which are stacks of small pellets of uranium-235. This is the nuclear material that will undergo the nuclear reaction process. The second are the control rods, marked B, which are rods typically made of cadmium, hafnium, or enriched boron, and are designed to regulate the nuclear reaction. Lowering the control rods into the reaction center absorbs neutrons, slowing the process of the reaction. Raising them allows the reaction to take place faster. The last is the water in which the fuel rods sit. This water is used to help absorb some of the excess heat that cannot be used and is a safety precaution. Heat from the reactor is used to boil water in the steam generator, marked D. The steam is then put through a progressively narrower pipeline, marked E, that increases the pressure of the steam when it reaches the turbine, marked H. The turbine is connected to a generator, marked G, which is in turn connected to a transformer, marked L, which takes the power onto the electrical grid. As the steam cools, it is collected in the condenser, marked I. Some of the heat is released by going through the cooling tower, marked J, where water vapor is released into the atmosphere. Some of the heat is released by discharging the water into a nearby body of water, such as a lake or stream. The rest is put back through the system using a pump, marked F. This same pump can be used to pull water from local sources for use in the plant. There are two types of nuclear reactions, fission and fusion. Fission is the process of splitting a nucleus of one radioactive element into other lighter elements. This process releases neutrons and other subatomic particles that can be useful in the continuation of a nuclear reaction. Fission releases vast amounts of energy in relation to the amount of energy required to cause the nuclear reaction in the first place. Fusion, on the other hand, is when two lighter elements are forced together to create a heavier element. This requires massive amounts of energy and heat, making it highly inefficient as an energy source. Almost all nuclear reactors in the world use fission as the source of their primary energy generation. In this process, a high energy neutron collides with an isotope of uranium called uranium-235. This isotope is radioactive, meaning that it is capable of spontaneous expulsion of neutrons in the formation of lighter elements. The addition of the high energy neutron speeds up the process and can cause a chain reaction that produces large amounts of energy. Natural radioactive decay takes place in what is known as a half-life which is the amount of time required for half of the radioactive material to convert to an inert or stable form. Most radioactive elements have known half-lives. 
For example, carbon-14 has a half-life of around 5,730 years, while argon has a half-life of just 35 days. Some half-lives are so short that it is almost impossible to measure them before they have already undergone decay. There are several methods to calculate half-life and the quantities of time of radioactive material associated with them. One way is to use the exponential decay formula seen here. The formula is shown where the final amount of the radioactive material can be found using the initial amount and the length of time and the half-life. Given any three of these variables, you can find the remaining one. Another method is to do the process longhand. Here you see two methods of solving this problem. Radium-226 has a half-life of 1,600 years. If the initial value was 53 grams and radium-226 is only safe in quantities smaller than three grams, how many years will it take for the radium-226 to be safe? There are two methods to solve this. One version is to use the exponential decay equation and plug and play. You end up with the formula 3 equals 53 times 1 half raised to the t over 1600 power. At this point, you solve for t, which will give you a specific value for the answer to the question you will have to use logarithm to solve this problem. The longhand method in this case will not give you a specific value. However, most math questions regarding half-life have an acceptable range of values that will receive points. In the longhand method, you begin with the starting value and divide it by two. Then you take that value and divide by two. You continue the process until you achieve a value below three. Then count how many times you divided. Each division is a half-life. In this case, it was five divisions to get below three, but it was far below three. In this case, we would multiply four by the half-life of 1600 and get 6400. We do the same with five, which gives us 8,000 years. So our answer is somewhere within the range of 6400 to 8,000. Logic tells us that it is likely closer to 6,400 than 8,000. The AP exam may give credit for any answer between 6,400 and, say, 6,800. Here we see the steps of producing electricity from a nuclear reaction. If you look closely, you'll see that the majority of these steps are the same as with generating electricity from fossil fuels. The difference here is the beginning fuel and the process of generating the heat needed to boil water. In nuclear power, the resource is most often uranium-235, which undergoes controlled nuclear fission. This releases large amounts of heat, which is used to boil water. The boiling water produces steam, which is collected and funneled through a progressively narrow pipe. The narrow pipe forces the steam under pressure, increasing its force as it is released onto a turbine. The turbine spins, which produces mechanical energy. The turbine is connected to a generator, which takes the mechanical energy of the spinning turbine and converts it to electrical energy, which can then be released onto the electrical grid. Through this process, chemical energy stored in the nuclei of uranium-235 is converted to mechanical and then electrical energy. Nuclear power has a variety of impacts based from the time the plant is developed to the time it is decommissioned. There are different problems associated with the building and decommissioning of a plant, as well as with the actual normal functioning of the plant. It is important to note that if everything is proceeding the way it should, radiation and radioactive material is not a normal pollutant associated with nuclear power. You see the term waste leakage identified here with an asterisk. This is because this only occurs when proper safety precautions have not been taken. Regarding the atmosphere, the major impact of nuclear power during normal function is the release of large amounts of water vapor from the cooling tower. Remember that water vapor is a greenhouse gas, and this can be a problematic contributor to climate change. Regarding soil, the major issue comes from the process of building the nuclear power plant. Soil erosion, 
particularly topsoil loss, can lead to siltation and increased turbidity in nearby water sources. Compaction of the soil and coverage with impermeable surfaces like concrete can reduce infiltration and increase surface runoff. It goes without saying that the construction of a nuclear power plant leads to habitat loss. It is possible if nuclear materials and waste products are not managed appropriately, there could be leakage into soil resources. However, this is highly unlikely due to the large amount of regulations and precautions put in place to prevent exactly this. Lastly, as it relates to water, the most pressing concern with nuclear power is the production of thermal pollution. This is the release of superheated water into nearby surface water. Thermal pollution pushes many animals beyond their zone of tolerance, leading to fish kills. The warmer water can also contribute to cultural eutrophication and the development of bacterial growth that can affect drinking water. As with soil impact, it is highly unlikely that properly managed nuclear waste materials will impact water resources during the regular and normal function of a nuclear power plant. That being said, there are several instances in which the normal function of a power plant has been disrupted. Three of the most famous and most devastating nuclear disasters are the Chernobyl meltdown of 1986, the Three Mile Island meltdown of 1979, and the Fukushima Daiichi collapse in 2011. Probably the most famous nuclear disaster, the Chernobyl meltdown was the result of a malfunctioning reactor due to both flawed design and inadequately trained personnel. Steam production in the reactor built up to a pressure that caused the safety containment of the reactor to fail, leading to release of nuclear material and a series of flash fires that spewed nuclear material across Europe in a 500 kilometer radius, covering over 150,000 square kilometers across southeastern Europe. The city around Chernobyl was completely abandoned with a 30 kilometer radius exclusion zone. At the top left, you'll see what is known as the elephant's foot, a large amount of radioactive material that has slowly been seeping down from the reactor above. Scientists worry that if the material reaches ground level, it could severely contaminate the soil and groundwater, causing the area to be severely uninhabitable for a much longer time period. The second most famous nuclear disaster, and the one that effectively killed nuclear power in the United States for decades, is the Three Mile Island disaster in Pennsylvania. This meltdown was, again, a result of both faulty equipment and operator error. One of the cooling systems in Tower 2 failed, leading to a backup of excessive amounts of heat that eventually allowed radioactive gas to be released to the surface. There was very little damage to the surrounding soil or water, but the damage was done in the public eye as far as nuclear energy. Lastly, and most recently, was the Fukushima Daiichi incident, which was a result of a tsunami that caused the collapse of several structures at the plant. The tsunami damaged the internal power grid, shutting off necessary power and essentially wiping out emergency generators. Without this, reactor one overheated, leading to a series of explosions that released radioactive materials into the water around the plant. To this day, there are regulations against the sale and consumption of fish found in the Fukushima area. Unlike power plants that run on fossil fuels, nuclear power plants cannot simply be left to crumble. Because of the potential dangers associated with the materials left behind, nuclear power plants undergo a process known as decommissioning. During this process, plants are required to apply for permission to go through decommissioning. The multi-step process requires the removal of the containment structures, storage of radioactive waste and materials, and evaluation of remaining structures for radiation prior to the destruction of the remaining components of the plant. One of the major aims of decommissioning is to remove any material that is or could be radioactive in order to store it in secure and stable locations. One of the most important steps of decommissioning is, is the process of removing and storing the radioactive waste materials. The majority of radioactive waste is stored in areas that are considered geologically stable. This means that the likelihood of geologic activity, such as volcanic eruptions or earthquakes, is highly unlikely. These areas should also be difficult for the public to access 
so they are often in areas controlled by military or other government organizations. In the United States, a vast majority of the radioactive waste is transported and stored in the Yucca Mountain Vault in Nevada. Located approximately 90 miles from Las Vegas on the Nellis Air Force Range, Yucca Mountain provides an ideal repository for the nation's radioactive waste products. The following slide provides you with an opportunity to see how some of these ideas are connected together. Feel free to pause the video and explore the connections between these topics. Then use the statements at the beginning to review.